my dear students a very warm welcome to you all in this session of anatomy where we will going to discuss about the fibula we know that our leg contains two bones one of them lie medially which is known as the tibia so the medial bone we are seeing here is the tibia whereas the other bone which lie laterally that is known as the fibula both of them are long bones but tibia is thicker and stronger whereas fibula is slender and weaker so fibula is a narrow and slender slender means thin it is a narrow and slender bone compared to the tibia which is much thicker and stronger in the slide we are seeing the tibia and fibula together both in the anterior view and in the posterior view and we can see that the majority of the length of the tibia and the fibula are connected by a broad membrane and that membrane is known as the interosseous membrane interosseous membrane here i must mention that in between tibia and fibula there are three joints in between the upper ends of tibia and fibula the joint is superior tibiofibular joint in between the shaft of tibia and fibula there is the middle tibiofibular joint and in between the lower end of tibia and fibula there is the inferior tibiofibular joint so there are three tibiofibular joints between the two bones of the leg the fibula is a long bone and hence it presents three parts upper end lower end and an intervening shaft let's mark the upper end lower end and the shaft this is the upper end of the fibula both in anterior and posterior view upper end upper end then the lower end lower end lower end and in between the upper and lower ends there lie the shaft shaft the upper end presents head and neck head and neck so first we discuss about the head now the head is kind of round and it presents the following three features first of all we mark the outline of the head okay this is the overall outline of the head this is count kind of round not exactly round almost round and it presents three features so in the head we get three features what are they number 1 an oval or circular articular facet on its superior surface so there goes an oval or articular surface on its superior facet this oval facet is being shown in the inset as well this is the oval facet oval articular facet and that articulates with a corresponding facet on the inferior lateral aspect of the lateral condyle of tibia we know that the upper end of the tibia consists of lateral condyle and a medial condyle and an intercondylar area and the inferior lateral aspect of lateral condyle presents an articular facet which articulates with the oval facet on the head of the fibula so head presents an oval articular facet 
articular facet then you get a styloid process posterolateral to the articular facet a styloid process so what is a styloid process styloid process is a kind of projection posterolateral to the head this is the styloid process this is the styloid process okay styloid process so another part of the head is styloid process and there is a sloping surface that is present in front of the styloid process so there is a sloping surface let's mark the sloping surface so here is a sloping surface in front of the styloid process seen from the frontal view and that is marked for the insertion of the biceps femoris biceps femoris is a muscle of the back of the thigh which is inserted on the sloping surface in front of the styloid process okay so articular facet styloid process and a sloping surface these are the three sub parts of the head now as we have talked about the head let's discuss the neck neck it is a adjoining constriction below the head so neck is this part neck and neck is related with a common peroneal nerve on the posterolateral aspect and with the anterior tibial artery on its medial surface in this diagram there is the anterior tibial artery anterior tibial artery that lie on the medial surface of the neck whereas this is a common peroneal nerve common peroneal nerve on the posterolateral aspect of the neck let's call it the neck so anterior tibial artery it lie on the medial aspect of the neck and common peroneal nerve it lie on the lateral aspect of the neck that common peroneal nerve divides into two terminal branches one and two one is the superficial peroneal nerve and the two is the deep peroneal nerve so the terminal branching of the common peroneal nerve occur at the level of the neck of the fibula on the lateral side of the neck of the fibula let's talk about the superior tibiofibular joint the superior tibiofibular joint it is a plain type of synovial joint and it is formed between the upper end of the fibula and the upper end of the tibia in between these two bones in between the upper end of these two bones there is a superior tibiofibular joint this joint is formed by the articulation between the oval articular facet on the lateral condyle of the tibia as i have already mentioned that the upper end of the tibia presents two condyle and an intercondylar area these two condyles are lateral condyle on the side of the fibula a medial condyle on the other side and in between them an intercondylar area now this lateral condyle on its inferior aspect bears an articular facet this articular facets articulates or meets with the corresponding facet on the head of the fibula and together they form the superior tibiofibular joint it is a synovial joint it presents a cavity and it is a plain type of synovial joint so superior 
tibio fibular joint it is a plain synovial joint this synovial joint between the upper end of the fibula and the upper end of the tibia it permits some amount of gliding movement or rotatory movement gliding movement for adjusting the lateral malleolus during the movement of ankle joint so when we move the ankle joint for example suppose during the dorsiflexion or plantar flexion the fibula kind of goes up and down so that up and down motion it is translated into some amount of gliding movement between these two articular facets the articular facet of fibula and the articular facet of tibia in the superior tibio fibular joint this joint is innervated by the nerve to popliteus and the recurrent genicular nerve okay now i will discuss about the fibular collateral ligament or the lateral collateral ligament on both side of the knee joint there are two collateral ligament on the lateral side there is the lateral or fibular collateral ligament so this is fibular collateral ligament whereas on the medial side there is a tibial collateral ligament tibial collateral ligament in a coronal section we can see the fibular collateral ligament like this and on the other side there is a tibial collateral ligament this one is the fibular collateral ligament it is also known as the lateral li collateral ligament or lateral ligament of the knee joint it is best viewed on the lateral profile of the knee where you can see the fibular collateral ligament like a cord like ligament cord like which is about 5 cm long so length is about 5 cm above it is attached to the lateral epicondyle of the femur the lower end of the femur presents two bulges on the lateral side it is the lateral condyle on the medial side it is the medial condyle the highest point or summit of the lateral condyle is known as the lateral epicondyle so this is the lateral epicondyle similarly the highest point of the medial condyle is medial epicondyle the fibular collateral ligament is attached to the lateral epicondyle of the femur okay so this is the lateral epicondyle to which the fibular collateral ligament is attached in the side view the lateral epicondyle can be marked with a point like this this is the lateral epicondyle and the lateral condyle on to which the lateral epicondyle is situated is like this that is the lateral condyle now important thing is that the origin of the fibular collateral ligament lies just above the popliteal groove on the lateral aspect we can see the that on the lateral side of the lateral condyle there is a groove like this so we are looking at the lateral side of lateral condyle if this is a lateral condyle and this is a medial condyle this side the aerohaded side would be the lateral side of lateral condyle and this side will be the medial side of medial condyle right so we are seeing from the lateral side of lateral condyle where you get to see a groove which accommodates the tendon of popliteus and that groove over here it is known as the popliteal groove
and the fibular collateral ligament is attached to the lateral surface of lateral condyle to the lateral epicondyle of the femur just above the popliteal groove you can see the lateral epicondyle is present just above the popliteal groove now regarding the relation of the fibular collateral ligament below it is embraced by the tendon of biceps femoris you can see the tendon of biceps femoris which is present lateral to the fibular collateral ligament so below and lateral relation of the fibular collateral ligament is the tendon of biceps femoris and this biceps femoris is attached to the head of the fibula i have already told you regarding the head of the fibula so this is the head of the fibula and you can see that the biceps femoris is attached to the head of the fibula now the fibular collateral ligament is separate from the capsular ligament this one is the capsular ligament the black colored outline thing is the capsular ligament of the knee joint or capsule of the knee joint the fibular collateral ligament obviously is separated from the capsular ligament by a considerable gap it is not adherent to the capsular ligament and in between the fibular collateral ligament and capsular ligament there lies a tendon this tendon in between the fibular collateral ligament and capsular ligament it is the tendon of popliteus tendon of popliteus okay so up to that part i hope you have understood next time clearing the picture so once again the lower and lateral part of the fibular collateral ligament is related to the tendon of biceps femoris the biceps femoris is attached below to the head of the fibula biceps femoris now in relation to the lower part of the fibular collateral ligament we call it the fibular collateral ligament like this in relation to the lower part there are two neurovascular structure which are called the inferior lateral genicular vessels and nerve which are present between the gap of fibular collateral ligament and the capsule what are the structures one is the inferior lateral genicular nerve another is the inferior lateral genicular vessels so let's mark this structure in between the gap between the fibular collateral ligament and capsule there we get the inferior lateral genicular vessels and the inferior lateral genicular nerve okay so these things inferior lateral genicular vessels and nerve inferior lateral genicular vessels and nerve are present in the gap between the lower end of fibular collateral ligament and the capsule of the knee joint we have got the name of biceps femoris during the discussion of the upper end of the fibula let's have a quick discussion about the biceps femoris muscle the biceps femoris muscle presents two head that's why it is named as biceps one is the long head and one is the short head depending upon the length the long head and short head are named 
the long head originates from the lower and medial part of the upper quadrilateral area of ischial tuberosity now you know that ischial tuberosity it is a part of ischium of the hip bone this ischial tuberosity is divided into two parts in an upper quadrilateral part upper quadrilateral part and a lower triangular part lower triangular part from the upper quadrilateral part a number of muscles take origin like semi membranosus semi tendinosus and long head of biceps femoris now in between them the biceps femoris muscle originates from the lower and medial part of the upper quadrilateral area so the upper quadrilateral area is divided into a lower and medial part this one and an upper and lateral part upper lateral part and a lower medial part from the lower and medial part the biceps femoris muscle the long head of biceps femoris muscle it takes origin so lower and medial part of the upper quadrilateral area of the ischial tuberosity the long head of the biceps femoris takes origin okay now after it takes its origin from the lower and medial part of the upper quadrilateral area it is inserted into the head of the fibula that i have already told you insertion into the head of fibula over here into the head of the fibula regarding the short head of biceps femoris the short head arises from the lateral leap of linea aspera now you know that linea aspera is a structure which is found on the posterior aspect of femur and it possesses two leaps this is the medial leap of linea aspera and this one is the lateral leap of linea aspera medial leap lateral leap lateral leap of linea aspera this lateral leap of linea aspera it continue downwards as the lateral supracondylar line of the femur this is the lateral supracondylar line of the femur now the short head of biceps femoris originates from the lateral leap of linea aspera like that and from the upper two third of the lateral supracondylar line this is the upper two third of the lateral supracondylar line and this short head after its origin it fuses with the long head and it inserts into the head of the fibula in front of the styloid process that i have already mentioned so both the heads both the heads though they originate differently but in it is inserted both of them are inserted into the head of the fibula regarding nerve supply one thing i must mention that the long head as it originates from the ischial tuberosity they belong to the hamstring group of muscle so the long head of biceps femoris it is a hamstring muscle so like every hamstring muscle the long head is supplied by the tibial part of sciatic nerve tibial part of sciatic nerve whereas the short head it does not belong to the 
hamstring muscle because it does not take origin from the ischial tuberosity and it is supplied by the common peroneal part of sciatic nerve short head common peroneal part of sciatic nerve here i must mention that the sciatic nerve sciatic nerve which is the nerve of the posterior compartment of the thigh has got two terminal divisions one is the tibial division which is called the tibial nerve another is the common peroneal division which is called the common peroneal nerve the tibial division of the sciatic nerve supplies the hamstring muscle whereas the common peroneal division of the sciatic nerve it supplies the short head of biceps femoris and then it is divided into a superficial peroneal nerve and a deep peroneal nerve tibial nerve after it supply the hamstring muscle at the back of the thigh continue further lower down go into the back of the leg and supply the compartment of the back of the leg back of leg whereas the common peroneal nerve if divides into superficial and deep peroneal nerve the deep peroneal nerve supplies the anterior compartment of leg or which is known as the extensor compartment and the superficial peroneal nerve it supplies the lateral compartment of leg which is called the peroneal compartment the lower end of the fibula is expanded anteroposteriorly to form lateral malleolus let's draw the outline of the lateral malleolus from the lateral view of the fibula is the lateral malleolus from the lateral side similarly this one is the outline of lateral malleolus lateral malleolus as well as lateral malleolus all of them now it presents four surface anterior posterior medial and lateral in the side view or lateral view the anterior surface is like this this is the anterior surface anterior surface anterior surface anterior surface and anterior surface so first one is the anterior surface number 1 anterior surface number 2 is the posterior surface let's see the posterior surface it is opposite the anterior surface this is the posterior surface posterior surface posterior surface posterior surface posterior surface and medial surface and lateral surface the lateral surface first we go into that the lateral surface is seen from this lateral view like this this is the lateral surface lateral surface lateral surface only can be seen from the lateral profile lateral surface and the rest is the medial surface that should be opposite to the lateral surface so in order to see the medial surface we have to make the tibia transparent so this surface which you can see through the transparent tibia is the medial surface medial 
surface. This medial surface has separately been seen in the diagram below. It is a schematic diagram of medial surface. Okay. So four surface: anterior, posterior, lateral, and medial. Now let's clear the outline of these markings. In a nutshell, there are four surfaces: anterior, posterior, seen from this side, lateral, lateral, and from that side, medial. So there are these four kind of surfaces. Coming to the anterior surface, the anterior surface is rough and rounded, and this anterior surface. provide attachment to the anterior talofibular ligament this is the anterior talofibular ligament anterior talo fibular so from the fibula to the talus let's mark the outline of the talus this is the talus so from the fibula to the talus anterior talofibular ligament and that extend from the anterior surface anterior surface anterior talofibular ligament here anterior talofibular ligament okay from the posterior surface the posterior surface a notch at the lower border of the anterior surface provide attachment to the calcaneofibular ligament this ligament at the lower border of the anterior surface it is called the calcaneofibular ligament calcaneo fibular ligament so over here is the attachment of calcaneo fibular ligament so anterior surface provide attachment to anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneo fibular ligament okay let's clear the picture regarding the posterior surface posterior surface presents a groove which lodges the tendons of peroneus brevis and the longus here on the posterior surface we can get to see two tendons like this one is the peroneus longus peroneus longus the peroneus longus the superficial one and the deeper one this is the peroneus brevis so let's mark the peroneus longus with red so this is the peroneus longus in red and let's mark the peroneus brevis with black this is the peroneus brevis so the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis muscles they lie or the lodge in a groove on the posterior surface of the lateral malleolus posterior surface regarding medial surface the medial surface it presents a groove it presents a triangular articular surface in the front there is a triangular articular surface in front and a depression below and behind it and the depression below and behind it so there is a triangular articular surface and the depression below and behind it the articular surface the articular surface is present to articulate with the talus to form the ankle joint 
so this articular surface is meant for talus so you can see that this triangular articular surface on the medial aspect it articulates with the similar articular facet on the side of the body of the talus we know about the body of the talus it presents a comma shaped articular surface lateral side a triangular articular surface on the lateral side comma shaped articular surface on the medial side and a trochlear articular surface on top of the body so this lateral articular surface on the lateral side of the body of talus talus body will articulate with the corresponding triangular articular surface on the medial surface of the lateral malleolus okay so we can draw it like this let's draw the body of the talus so it fits like this the triangular articular surface over here there is the comma shaped articular surface on this side okay so medial surface presents a triangular articular surface in front which articulates with the talus and form part of the ankle joint and a depression malleolar fossa below and behind this is the malleolar fossa this one malleolar fossa the upper end of the malleolar fossa provide attachment to the posterior tibiofibular ligament here upper end of the malleolar fossa posterior tibio fibular ligament okay and its lower end to the posterior talofibular ligament and its lower end to the posterior talo fibular ligament posterior tibio fibular and posterior talo fibular now if you look at the posterior tibio fibular and talo fibular i will show you this is the posterior tibio fibular ligament seen from the behind and this one is the posterior talo fibular ligament in red posterior talo fibular and this one is the posterior tibio fibular okay so we have covered the medial surface and the lateral surface this one lateral surface the lateral surface is triangular and subcutaneous so when you clear the diagram from all these annotations you'll get to see the lateral surface which is triangular and subcutaneous and you can feel the lateral surface by mere palpation on your foot so by that way the four surfaces on the lower end of the tibia provide attachment and articulation the ankle joint presents two collateral ligament one is the lateral collateral ligament on to the side of the fibula one is the medial collateral ligament on to the side of the tibia the lateral collateral ligament is also known as the lateral ligament of the ankle joint and this lateral ligament is best viewed from the lateral aspect and it consists of three parts now let's draw the outline of the lateral malleolus from the lateral view and already we know that the lateral malleolus presents four surfaces on the lateral view it presents the lateral surface anterior surface posterior surface the medial surface is not visible from this view it is opposite the lateral surface now the lateral collateral ligament of ankle joint or in other words the lateral ligament of ankle joint it consists of three parts first of all anterior talofibular 
next posterior talofibular and calcaneo fibular the anterior talofibular ligament extend forward let's mark the anterior talofibular ligament first this is the anterior talofibular ligament anterior talo fibular ligament this anterior talofibular ligament in the anterior view it looks like this talofibular that means from fibula to talus so let's mark the talus as well here goes the outline of the talus in this view so the anterior talofibular ligament is a weak flat band and it extend forward and medially obviously you can see it is extending forward and medially from the frontal view forward and medially from the anterior margin of lateral malleolus this is the anterior margin or anterior surface of the lateral malleolus to the neck of the talus we know that the talus have got a head this is the head of the talus and head is followed by the neck this is the neck so anterior talofibular ligament is extended up to the neck of the talus okay so the first part of the lateral ligament has been described next is the posterior talofibular ligament the posterior talofibular ligament it is a strong band and from the lateral view it looks like this posterior talofibular ligament and it extends backward and medially from the posterior margin or posterior surface of lateral malleolus so that is the posterior talo fibular ligament this one posterior talo fibular it extend backward and medially from the posterior margin of lateral malleolus to the posterior tubercle of talus we know that the talus presents posterior tubercle on its posterior surface so we can mark the posterior tubercles over there this is the posterior tubercles of talus on the posterior surface of the talus and up to this posterior tubercle the posterior talofibular ligaments are extended posterior tubercle of talus and the third is the calcaneo fibular ligament which is a wrong rounded cord and runs downward and backward from the notch on the lower border of lateral malleolus so this is a calcaneo fibular ligament it actually extend from the lower part of the anterior border or anterior surface and it extend downward and backward downward and backward to the tubercle on the lateral surface of calcaneum there is a tubercle on the lateral surface of the calcaneus calcaneus so this one is the calcaneo fibular ligament the name is after the two bones with which it is attached so calcaneo fibular ligament attaches the lateral surface of calcaneus with the lower end of the fibula you know that fibula presents three borders anterior posterior and medial and three surfaces in between the three borders the borders of fibula are very twisted and they are very difficult to point out in a bone so to focus too much on the borders will be a waste of time rather we would understand the borders in context to the tibia as well as with the help of a schematic diagram we know that tibia tibia has got three borders the first one is the anterior border then medial border medial border 
and a lateral border or interosseous border. Similarly, fibula presents also presents three borders. Here goes the anterior border. Then there is a posterior border. and an interosseous border which is connect which is connected to the similar limb border of the tibia by the interosseous membrane the interosseous border of the fibula is also known as the medial border now the thing is that in a live specimen of bone it is rather difficult to pinpointly locate these three borders but still I am giving you a glimpse regarding the borders of the fibula. First of all, this is the anterior border. The anterior border goes downward, downward and then it kind of bifurcates into two parts enclosing a triangular area. This is the anterior border. Anterior border. The posterior border on this side This is the posterior border. And the interosseous border, the medial border is this one. Okay. So this is a very rough depiction of the borders. I again remind you to focus too much on the borders it not needed what is needed is to understand the surface and border relationship and the overall concept now remember that in between the three borders the fibula presents three surfaces. so first of all there is a medial surface medial surface is present in between the anterior border and the interosseous border okay so this is the medial surface in between the anterior and the posterior border there lie the lateral or peroneal surface and in between the posterior border and the interosseous border there lie the posterior surface so three surfaces are medial, lateral and posterior. Okay. So in the bone specimen, in the diagram, we can mark the medial, lateral and posterior like this. First regarding the medial surface, this is this one, medial surface between the anterior border and the interosseous border regarding the peroneal or lateral surface this is between the anterior and the posterior borders and regarding the posterior surface that cannot be seen from the anterior view the posterior surface has to be marked from the back this is the posterior surface So that is a gross overview of the surfaces and the borders of the fibula. Let us discuss about the anterior border. The anterior border begins just below the anterior aspect of the head over here and then it goes down and down. So we are going down the anterior border and inferiorly it splits to enclose a triangular area as I have already told you this is splitting to enclose a triangular area and this triangular area continue downward on the lateral surface of lateral malleolus so this is the lateral malleolus this is the lateral surface of lateral malleolus 
lateral surface of lateral malleolus so this triangular area which is enclosed by the splitting anterior border it is continue downwards as the lateral surface of lateral malleolus that being the anterior border now superior extensor retinacula which is a modification of deep fascia in front of the ankle it is attached to the anterior margin of the triangular area so over here is attachment of the superior extensor retinacula whereas the superior peroneal retinaculum is attached to the posterior margin of the triangular area superior peroneal retinaculum the anterior border provides attachment to the anterior intermuscular septum of the leg now in the cross section of the leg we get to see the fibula like this the tibia like this the tibia presents the anterior and posterior borders as well as the medial or interosseous border so here goes the anterior border in the cross section this is the posterior border and this is the interosseous border the interosseous border is easy to understand because of its attachment to the interosseous membrane regarding the anterior and posterior border the anterior border gives attachment to a septum this septum is known as anterior intermuscular septum similarly the posterior border attach and give attachment to the posterior intermuscular septum so from the anterior border anterior intermuscular septum from the posterior border posterior intermuscular septum okay in between these two septums anterior intermuscular septum and posterior intermuscular septum enclosed is the lateral compartment of the leg that is also known as the peroneal compartment of the leg the superior extensor retinaculum that is this band it is actually a thickened deep fascia in front of the ankle so it is a modification of the deep fascia and it is present just above the ankle joint and vertically it is about 1.5 inches wide medially it is attached to the lower part of the anterior border of tibia this is the anterior border of tibia and in the lower part of the anterior border the medially it is attached lower part of anterior border of tibia whereas laterally the anterior border of the fibula split to enclose a triangular area on the anterior margin of the triangular area is the attachment of the superior extensor retinacula so laterally it is attached to the lower part of the anterior border of fibula this you know is the anterior border of fibula to the lower part of the anterior split portion of the anterior border is the attachment of the superior extensor retinaculum now we are going to the relation let's clear the picture before that medially it splits to enclose the tendon of tibialis anterior so if we go medially and take a cross section you will see 
that medially it is splitting to enclose the tendon of tibialis anterior. This is the tibialis anterior. Tibialis anterior tendon. This one. That is passing through the split fascia. Tibialis anterior. Okay. And the other structures of the anterior compartment, that is the extensor hallucis longus, deep peroneal nerve, anterior tibial artery extensor digitorum longus. So, all the other structures like this one, extensor hallucis longus, then this artery and nerve then the tendons of extensor digitorum longus and peroneus tertius all these thing Next, we discuss about the relation of the superior extensor retinaculum. Look, medially, it splits to enclose the tendon of tibialis anterior. So, the tibialis anterior tendon, that is this tendon, it is actually passing through the split fascia of the superior extensor retinaculum and then coming out from its distal aspect like that. So, this is the tendon of the tibialis anterior. You can see on the medial side, the fascia is split to incorporate the tendon of tibialis anterior. Tibialis anterior. So, tibialis anterior is kind of passing through the superior extensor retinaculum and all the other structures of the anterior compartment, namely the tendon of the extensor hallucis longus. This one is the tendon of extensor hallucis longus. Trace it and it is going to the hallux. Then the extensor digitorum longus tendon which splits and go to the lateral four fingers along with the peroneus tertius and in between them these things the anterior tibial artery and deep peroneal nerve all these structures all the other structures so all these other structures apart from the tibialis anterior all the other structures they pass deep to the they pass deep to the retinaculum so all the other structures they are passing deep to the retinaculum look all other structures passing deep to superior extensor retinaculum and tibialis anterior is passing through. So, that is the difference between the passage of tibialis anterior and all the other tendons with regards to the superior extensor retinaculum. Again, let us clear the picture and identify the individual components. This is the tibialis anterior already told you passing through the medial split end of the superior extensor retinaculum. This is the extensor hallucis longus, extensor hallucis longus, this one, extensor hallucis longus. These two over here extensor digitorum longus and peroneus tertius together. So, extensor digitorum longus and peroneus tertius together plus peroneus tertius together. Extensor digitorum longus, peroneus tertius together. Okay. And here 
we get the anterior tibial artery and deep peroneal nerve anterior tibial artery deep peroneal nerve anterior tibial artery deep peroneal nerve So that is all about the superior extensor retinaculum. That may come as a short note while we read about the lower end of the fibula. Superior peroneal retinaculum is another modification of deep fascia situated on the side of the ankle. This is a superior peroneal retinaculum and it is situated just behind the lateral mandibulus. Regarding its attachment, anteriorly it is attached to the back of the lateral mandibulus and posteriorly it is attached to the lateral surface of the calcaneus and also to the superficial transverse fossil septum of the leg. Regarding the relation of the superior peroneal retinaculum, superior peroneal retinaculum, the tendons of both peroneus longus and peroneus brevis lie deep to this retinaculum in a single compartment. Its color, these two tendons are different color. The peroneus longus lies superficial to the peroneus brevis. In the black, we are drawing the tendon of the peroneus longus. This is the guy peroneus longus. Peroneus longus. Whereas deep to it lie the peroneus brevis. So this one is the peroneus brevis and both of them are passing deep to the superior peroneal retinaculum. So let us again clear the picture and take a look at them. This is the peroneus longus, this is the peroneus brevis. brevis peroneus longus. The posterior border of the fibula. This is the posterior border of the fibula on cross section. This is the posterior border of the fibula which give attachment to the posterior intermuscular septum. Posterior intermuscular septum. This posterior border of fibula is extended from the posterior aspect of the head and neck of the fibula and goes downward like this. And extend up to the lateral margin of the groove on the posterior surface of lateral mandibulus. Now we know on the posterior surface of lateral mandibulus there is a groove for lodgement of the peroneus longus and brevis and up to the lateral margin of that groove the posterior border is extended. So that is the posterior border of the fibula and it gives attachment posterior intermuscular septum of the leg. Okay. Let us talk about the interosseous or medial border. The interosseous border in its upper part it lie close and just medial to the anterior border. So let us mark the interosseous border in the upper end. This is the interosseous border in the upper end. Whereas anterior border in the upper end is like this. So in the upper end the interosseous border is twice quite close to the anterior border. And then it goes on downward and along the length it gives attachment to the interosseous membrane going down and down 
and ultimately it ends up at the upper end of a roughened triangular area so it kind of splits into a roughened triangular area when we enlarge this view we can see that the interosseous border it is splitting into a roughened triangular area like that which gives attachment to the interosseous ligament so into the roughened triangular area is the attachment of interosseous ligament which connects the inferior aspect of both the tibia and fibula over here interosseous ligament attachment and the rest of the interosseous border gives attachment to the interosseous membrane this is the interosseous membrane i m in between the shafts of tibia and the fibula and the interosseous membrane on both side is attached to the interosseous membrane interosseous border of tibia as well as to the interosseous border of the fibula now interosseous border is attached along the whole leng length of the interosseous border except at the upper end where it leaves a small gap and that gap is left for the passage of anterior tibial vessels the anterior tibial vessels come out through the gap and extend downward below in front of the interosseous membrane anterior tibial vessel Now we discuss about the middle tibiofibular joint which is formed between the shaft of fibula and the shaft of tibia and the middle tibiofibular joint it's a fibrous joint which is formed by the interosseous membrane and this interosseous membrane connect the interosseous border of the shafts of tibia and fibula so on both side of the interosseous membrane lie the interosseous border of the fibula as well as the interosseous border of the tibia now the direction of the fibers the direction of the membrane of the interosseous membrane fibers are directed downward and laterally okay the middle tibiofibular joint it is a fibrous joint formed by the interosseous membrane which connect the interosseous borders of the shafts of tibia and fibula the interosseous borders are present on both side of the interosseous membrane so this is the interosseous border of the fibula and this one is the interosseous border of the tibia these two interosseous borders are connected by the interosseous membrane and the direction of the fibers of the interosseous membrane are downward and laterally so that is the proper direction downward and laterally the interosseous membrane is wide above and narrow below you can see from the picture it is wide above and below it narrows down and below it blends with the interosseous ligament of the inferior tibiofibular joint now i have already told you that the interosseous border of the fibula it goes down and down and ultimately it kind of splits to form a triangular area this triangular area fits with the corresponding triangular area on the lower end of the tibia and these two triangular areas are connected by the interosseous ligament interosseous ligament over there that means the interosseous membrane interosseous membrane okay it blends below with the interosseous ligament interosseous ligament of inferior tibiofibular joint there is a large opening 
above the upper free margin of the interosseous membrane, it provides passage to the anterior tibial vessels. These vessels pass through the anterior surface of the interosseous membrane. That's why they are called the anterior tibial vessels. Anterior tibial vessels lie on the anterior surface of interosseous membrane. Near the lower end, the interosseous membrane presents a small opening. There is a small opening near the lower end. Let me clear the picture and show you the small opening. There is a small opening near the lower end for the passage of perforating branch of peroneal artery, which comes from the posterior compartment to the anterior compartment. This is called the perforating branch of peroneal artery. Perforating branch of peroneal artery. What is the function of interosseous membrane? Obviously, interosseous membrane provides additional surface for the attachment of the muscle. Later on, we will see a number of muscles take their origin with the interosseous membrane along with the adjoining shafts of tibia and fibula. It obviously binds the tibia and fibula together and gives them stability and it raises downward movement of fibula by the powerful fibular muscle. It has to be remembered that most of the muscles of the leg in the anterior and peroneal compartment are attached to the fibula. These powerful muscles try to move the fibula around by their contraction. Inferior tibiofibular joint, it is a syndesmosis variety of fibrous joint and it is the strongest of all the three tibiofibular joints. We know that in between tibia and fibula there is superior, middle and inferior tibiofibular joints and the inferior tibiofibular joint is the strongest strongest of the three joints. Now the inferior tibiofibular joint actually maintains the integrity of the ankle joint. The strength of the ankle joint largely depends upon the integrity of the inferior tibiofibular joint, how the lower end of the tibia and fibula holds up. The roughened opposed surfaces of the lower ends of tibia and fibula are connected by a very strong interosseous ligament and that interosseous ligament can be seen in a coronal section passing through the lower end of the tibia and fibula. This is the interosseous membrane, interosseous ligament which connects the lower end of tibia and fibula and it is the chief bond of union between the lower end of these bones. The interosseous ligament is covered both in front and behind by the anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligament. This is the anterior tibiofibular ligament. Anterior tibiofibular ligament. This is the posterior tibiofibular ligament. Posterior tibiofibular ligament and in between these two ligament lie the interosseous ligament. The posterior tibiofibular ligament is stronger than the anterior tibiofibular ligament and the lower end of the posterior tibiofibular ligament it forms the inferior transverse tibiofibular ligament. Inferior transverse tibio fibular ligament which is a strong thick band of yellowish elastic fiber which pass transversely from the upper part of the malleolar fossa to the posterior border of the articular surface of the tibia. The inferior tibio fibular joint permits slight movements to allow the lateral malleolus to rotate laterally during dorsiflexion of the ankle. So the inferior tibiofibular joint it allow or permit slight movement so that the lateral malleolus can rotate laterally lateral rotation 
during the dorsiflexion of the ankle joint. To talk about the surfaces. First of all, the medial surface. The medial surface of the fibula lie between the anterior and interosseous border. So this is the medial surface, which lie between the anterior border and the interosseous border. It gives origin to extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and peroneus tertius. So, extensor digitorum longus having an extensive origin along the upper three fourth. Then, extensor extensor hallucis longus, a little less extensive origin than the extensor digitorum longus, and it occupy the middle two fourth. So, it is upper three fourth it is middle to fourth and below it gives the origin of the peroneus tertius in the lower one fourth peroneus tertius in the lower one fourth so here goes the extensor digitorum longus extensor hallucis longus and the peroneus tertius on the extensor aspect or the medial surface of the shaft of the fibula. So medial surface gives rise to three muscle extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, peroneus tertius. You can see the extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus and peroneus tertius tendon side by side. The extensor hallucis longus it is inserted to the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe. Base of distal phalanx of great toe. That's why it is called extensor hallucis longus. Now coming to the peroneus tertius, it is inserted on the dorsal surface of the base of fifth metatarsal. So here it goes. Dorsal surface of the base of fifth metatarsal. Dorsal surface of base of fifth metatarsal. But the extensor digitorum longus tendons, which split into four tendons, the extensor digitorum longus, they are attached to the middle and distal phalanges of the lateral four toes by four tendons. On the inset, the middle and the distal phalanx have been shown. Each of the extensor tendon for example I take this one the trifurcate one two three clear the picture and once again show the same thing each of the extensor tendon at the level of the base of the middle phalanx the trifurcate two lateral sheep they go upward and are inserted into the base of the distal phalanx and the middle slip it is inserted in the base of the middle phalanx so that is the way they are inserted okay so all these three extensor hallucis longus digitorum longus and peroneus tertius belong to the anterior compartment and their function is extensor of the phalanges of the big toe, extensor of the meta tarsophalangeal, proximal interphalangeal, and distal interphalangeal joints of the lateral foot toes, along with the dorsiflexion and eversion of the foot that is brought about by the peroneus tertius, along with the other muscles. Let us discuss the lateral or peroneal surface and the lateral surface lie between the anterior border and the posterior border of the fibula. So this is the lateral surface of the fibula. It gives 
origin to two muscles peroneus longus above and peroneus brevis below actually the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis have overlapping in their origin from the peroneal surface of the fibula the peroneal longus it originates from the upper two third of the lateral surface okay and the peroneus brevis it originates from the lower two third of the peroneal surface so this is the peroneus longus this is the peroneus brevis so in the middle there is an overlapping in the middle one third there is an overlapping between the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis and in the zone of overlapping okay the peroneus longus lie posteriorly and the peroneus brevis lie in the anterior half peroneus longus peroneus brevis we are looking from the lateral surface or the peroneal aspect of the fibula where we get to see the attachment of the peroneus longus and the peroneus brevis the peroneus longus it cover the upper two third of the lateral surface whereas the peroneus brevis in the lower Two third of the peroneal surface. So if we put them side by side, there is an overlap between them two in the middle one third. The peroneus brevis in this zone of overlapping lie anteriorly. Peroneus longus in the zone of overlapping lie posteriorly. Regarding the insertion of the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis, what we get to see is that the peroneus longus after grooving through the inferior surface of the cuboid bone it passes through the plantar surface of the articulated foot and it is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first metatarsal lateral side of the base of the first metatarsal along with the adjoining medial cuneiform medial cuneiform first metatarsal so that is regarding the insertion of peroneus longus regarding the insertion of peroneus brevis this one it is attached on the lateral side of the base of fifth metatarsal this is the fifth metatarsal fifth metatarsal so onto the lateral side of the base of the fifth metatarsal okay now coming to the posterior surface which lie between the interosseous border and the posterior border it is extensive and it gives attachment to the following muscle number 1 soleus number 2 tibialis posterior and number 3 flexor hallucis longus okay the upper two third of the posterior surface is divided by a medial crest this is the medial crest into a medial concave part and a flat lateral part so on the medial side of medial crest there is a medial concave part on the lateral side there is a lateral flattened part without going into the nitty gritty and the details of the exact attachment of the three muscle we can just say that the posterior surface of the fibula is the site of attachment of the following three muscle one is the soleus above one below is the tibialis posterior and still below it the flexor hallucis longus now when we see the flexor hallucis longus this is the outline of the flexor hallucis longus on the posterior surface and it originates from the lower 3/4 of the posterior surface of the shaft of the fibula 
behind the medial crest so there goes the medial crest and the fibula and the flexor hallucis longus originates from behind the medial crest okay regarding the tbl is posterior which is the deepest muscle of the back of the leg it originates from the upper two third of the posterior surface of the tibia along with the posterior surface of fibula in front of the medial crest so the attachment of the tibial is posterior lie in front of the medial crest that means medial crest medial crest help us to differentiate between the attachment of the tibial is posterior which lie in front and above it and the flexor hallux is longer which lie below and behind the medial crest it is important to mention that along the medial crest run the peroneal artery regarding the ossification the fibula ossifies from three centers one primary and two secondary centers the primary centers appear in the middle of the shaft primary center at the age of the eighth week of intrauterine life and there are two secondary centers the secondary center for the upper end it appears at the age of 3 to 4 years and it fuses with the shaft at the end of 20 years fusion whereas for the lower end the secondary center appears 1 to 2 years and fusion with the shaft is 18 years in fibula the law of union of epiphysis is violated according to that law the epiphyseal center or secondary center which appear first will unite last or fuse last with the diaphysis but in fibula the secondary center for the lower end though it appears first in the age of 1 to 2 years compared to the secondary center of upper end which appears at 3 to 4 years it unites first so contrary to the traditional law of union of epiphysis the secondary center for the lower end appear first as well as unite first which violates the law of union of epiphysis okay appears first unites first and according to the law of union of epiphysis usually the center which appears first will unite last so there is a violation of law of union of epiphysis in the lower end of fibula that often comes as a question last but not the least the side determination and anatomical position the side of the fibula can be determined by holding it vertically in such a way so that the head head lie upward it should be directed upward the flattened lateral malleolus will be downward the triangular articular facet this triangular articular facet at the lower end will face medially medially and the malleolar fossa the malleolar fossa at the medial surface will lie behind and below the triangular articular surface so while holding the fibula when you look at the medial surface you have to put the articular surface on front and the malleolar fossa behind if you maintain the relative location of the articular facet and the malleolar fossa in the lower end then you can be sure that you are holding the fibula in correct anatomical position since fibula does not take part in formation of the knee joint where only the tibia femur or pad and patella take part so fibula also does not transmit body weight it does not take part in the transmission of body weight so what is the function of fibula if it does not transmit the body weight fibula provides the attachment you see on the anterior and the lateral compartment of the leg most of the muscle 
except the tibial is anterior is attached to the fibula so it acts as the site of attachment of the muscle for the anterior and lateral compartment of the leg and number 2 its lower end that is the lateral malleolus along with the lower end of the tibia and medial malleolus it forms a socket which is called the tibio fibular mortis tibio fibular mortis which holds the talus in place so talus kind of fits in it and forms the ankle joint regarding clinical correlation since the fibula does not take part in transmission of body weight it is a common source of bone for grafting bony parts often cut out from the fibula to act as a graft material okay since its loss does not make any profound effect on the transmission of the body weight and number two fibular fracture it is a slender and weak bone so it is commonly fractured two to five centimeter proximal to the distal end of the lateral medullus two to five centimeter proximal to the lower end of lateral malleolus it is often associated with the fracture dislo fractured dislocation of the ankle joint so fracture of the fibula is often associated with the dislocation of ankle joint dislocation of ankle joint fracture fibula so with that I would like to conclude the discussion on fibula. Please go through the book and if you have any query, ask me. I would try to answer my best. Thank you all.